welcome back to the Skill Builders Guild. Thanks again for watching. It's the Axial SCX-10 3 step-by-step -step build series. This is steps A1 through C6. First things first, this uh, icon key is really cool. Lots of nice diagrams to help explain each uh, instruction on each step. These are the new AR45 portal axles. They are a one-piece design, double shear for both shocks and links. Uh, uses the uh, standard uh, ring and pinion that we're used to. New uh, diff covers though, so uh, old ones won't fit. Um, and that's the rear portal as well. Uh, you can see that uh, it's also a one-piece design, but heavily trussed. Uh, lots of um, support built into these axles. Uh, same with the front as well. You can see there's a ton of support on the top of the shafts there. Uh, so um, let's get right into the construction here. This is step A1. These are the front ring uh, and uh, pinion uh, gear lock assembly. Um, this is the locker, of course. Now it's a six-hole uh, six design. Uh, of course, anytime metal on metal is going to come into contact, you're going to want to use thread lock uh, just to uh, secure everything in place. These are uh, 7 by 14 by 3.5 mil bearings on either side of the uh, ring gear and uh, a five by 14 on the inside of the pinion. On the outside, once you've put that into the axle housing, there's a five by 11 by four millimeter bearing. You'll want to apply a liberal amount of black grease to both the ring and pinion after you've inserted them here. Always best to make sure that everything's spinning nice and freely. I used the included grease in the kit. You can use lithium grease or marine grease, whatever uh, grease uh, turns your crank, <laughs> they'll all work just fine. Um, but uh, yeah, just used what was included for this build. I always make sure that everything's spinning freely before I do any uh, moving on to the next step. Now we're on to A3. This is the portal knuckle assembly. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, there are two different housings for the front and the rear. Uh, you do want to make sure you're using the right one in the front because uh, otherwise it won't work. And I actually did that by mistake, so keep that in mind. Lots of uh, gears here. There is reduction at the portal, as you can see. Uh, it goes from a smaller uh, gear at the output to um, a much larger gear for the actual axle output. Again, more grease, making sure that everything is nicely lubricated. Um, these portal boxes are a nice design, nice and rigid, lots of support for all the bearings that are included as well. And uh, here we are just assembling everything in rapid speed because um, nobody needs to watch me drilling and screwing that much. Once you've, uh, once you've got that portal box assembled, you're gonna wanna put the universal in front. And this is the uh, knuckle assembly of A4. Uh, and incidentally, uh, I've always got the instruction manual right there in the bottom corner so you can always see what step we're on. Uh, I didn't have any trouble here. Uh, everything went together really nicely. Lots of bearings, lots of support for the axle shafts and uh, everything goes together really well. You won't need thread lock here because this is plastic into plastic. Don't over tighten those screws, otherwise you won't get free movement of those knuckles. And it's important that those are able to turn freely. So there's both knuckles installed and we're gonna move on to the rear axle and fast forward through that because you've already seen all the same steps. Uh, this uh, whole assembly here is the same. Just keep in mind that those portal uh, covers are different for the rear axle, so you do need to make sure that, and they are labeled uh, in the actual kit, one for the front, two for the rear. And just checking to make sure everything's spinning freely again, and uh, we're done with the axle assembly. Now we can move on to B1. The most hated uh, part of assembly is shock assembly. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, uh, but I did use some green slime uh, just to help mitigate or minimize as much uh, leakage as possible. Every shock that I've ever owned from Axial in the past has definitely suffered from leaking, except the Capra shocks. Those are uh, pretty fantastic, and since these are uh, an exact duplicate of that design, we shouldn't see much leakage here either, 
but it is always a nice preventative measure to include some green slime. And uh, I'll put a link down below to where you can pick some of that up. Otherwise, uh, a, a shock assembly here is pretty straightforward, pretty much exactly the same as uh, any shock you've built in the past. Um, there are eclips, pretty unavoidable. <laughs> Hard to get away from an eclip and uh, watch me struggle with them here. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, they do tend to get away from you. Uh, I probably cut out most of the, uh, the mishaps on those eclips and luckily they didn't fly too far when they uh, shot off the workbench. <laughs> You'll have to do this whole assembly four times uh, because there's four shocks. Um, but everything's already off the tree and I mentioned that in the review video. You don't have to trim anything off of a plastic parts tree. Everything is just ready to go, which is really, really nice. Uh, the uh, included uh, O-rings uh, are um, seem to uh, do a pretty good job of keeping the oil inside the shock. And as long as you're not overfilling them, uh, you shouldn't have much problem with leakage. This is a really excellent tool. Uh, this is my team associated shock building uh, clamp or pliers. Uh, they do a really great job of holding on and not damaging that shock shaft so you can actually uh, install all of the uh, parts required. Um, like these um, rod ends on the end here. I'm using my Serba tool as well. and It's an excellent tool for any rod end installation on a shaft. It's uh, the easiest way to do it for sure. Because these are designed and modeled after the Capra shock, they do come with this really great plastic bleeder cap. Uh, makes filling the shock super easy. I used the included uh, shock oil, which I believe is a 30 weight. Uh, I can't remember, it wasn't uh, clearly labeled, but I'm pretty sure it's a, a lightweight oil. Make sure that uh, you get as many bubbles out from underneath as possible. Screw that uh, bleeder cap on nice and uh, tightly and uh, at that point some oil may leak out of the bleeder cap and that's totally fine uh, but then install that bleeder cap. Uh, I usually do it when the shock is fully compressed um, and then you get a nice flowing easygoing shock with not a ton of air inside. There are two different spring weights for these shocks. You want the much firmer rate spring to be in the front there is a lot more weight over that front axle, so uh, having a bit more dampening up front is a very good idea. Uh, anything to get that rebound um, and, f and keep a bit of firmness in that front is really important. So make sure that when you build these shocks that you put the proper shock springs on the proper set of shocks. Now we're moving on to step C1, which is the beginning of the transmission assembly. Uh, I built this as stock, and uh, the uh, the way it's the way it's shown in the manual is to install both the two-speed and the dig. So we'll be doing that here. Uh, you can see that uh, the dig and the two-speed is actuated by these little, uh, I guess you could call it like a dog bone uh, sort of assembly. Uh, if you choose not to install either the dig or the two-speed, there are very specific instructions uh, in here to show you how to not engage either of those two things. And it's with a tiny little black spacer, um, which I don't think I'm going to show here in this video. It's great to see a dig coming standard in a trail truck. I know that DIG is generally relegated to class three trucks only if you're looking to comp with it, but uh, this was a, a good feature. It's a, it's a fun feature to play with and uh, it really does kind of make a trail truck a lot more effective on the trails and on the rocks for that matter. For the two-speed, uh, as this build is going together here, for the two-speed, there are two different gears that engage when you are using the two-speed. Um, it's either an 18 and 40, 
or a 23 and 35 to give you uh, significantly different gear ratios for first and second gear. Construction of this and assembly uh, was really nice. All the parts are very nicely molded. Uh, I didn't have any issues whatsoever in the assembly and everything went together really well. What I'm putting together here is the actual, uh, this is the actual transmission assembly. And uh, what I'm starting to install there is the lever to engage uh, the two speed transmission. And uh, it just uh, uses a servo to actuate either forward or reverse of that shaft, moving the gears from one position to the next to get the higher gear ratio. Additionally, as we're getting into step C2 here, uh, there is an option in the manual for either a one-to-one -one ratio on the transfer case or, uh, or a 1.7 to one ratio if you're not using portal axles, which leads me to believe that there will be a portal-less version of the SCX-10 III coming in the future. Uh, a lot of folks have asked if uh, a standard AR-44 axle will work. Uh, the link mounts are different uh, on the AR-45, so I presume that there will be a new AR-45 portal-less or straight axle version. So uh, that's something to definitely keep in mind. If you uh, are going to be building this uh, out of the out of the box with portals, you'll want to use that one to one uh, on the output. This is a very complicated transmission. I won't understate that. It is important that you follow the directions very carefully in order to maintain, uh, as it is sort of the lifeblood of the whole truck. You'll definitely want to make sure you do it right. So please take your time when you're doing this. Uh, you'll note that there is a ton of gears. Uh, in this transmission and it's all around the two speed and the dig portion of how this thing works. Uh, it would be interesting to see a more simplified version. I doubt that we will. I think it'll just, uh, if there is an RTR version of this, I, I imagine that they're going to build it in such a way that it includes everything that you see in the kit, probably just locking out the two speed or the dig or a combination of those two. Uh, my guess uh, is that they'll include the parts to unlock those things so you can actually use them uh, if you choose to go that route. Now you can see uh, that output there, that is where the dig is going to go. And this little assembly here is the dig assembly. Um, and uh, the uh, important thing to note is that, of course, you'll need all of these parts even if you aren't going to install the dig. Again, it's just a spacer on that shaft right there to eliminate the dig entirely from moving back and forth. And it's nice that Axial includes all those parts because a lot of people don't want the complexity. And uh, that's sort of important to keep in mind. It, it doesn't always have to be as complex as uh, the manufacturer makes it. And it's really great that they're giving you the option to eliminate it if that's something that you're not interested in. Nice solid metal pieces there uh, to engage or disengage the dig. Uh, there shouldn't be any failure points there. Uh, you'd have to really overpower it on like 8S, for example, to break any of these pieces, I, I believe. The dig is servo actuated just like the two speed. Um, and uh, once we get closer to the chassis build, you'll see how all these things start to work together. This is part of the uh, actual uh, lever assembly that's going to make that dig engage or disengage. It's very important that uh, once we get into the actual step later on, that you set up your endpoints properly. Uh, otherwise, you could just freewheel the whole time. And I, it's possible for sure. Um, definitely something that you'll want to pay attention to. Uh, and when you are going to get to that step, don't have the servo horn attached to the servo yet until you fire everything up zeroed and um, make sure you've got your endpoints uh, all zeroed out so you don't burn a servo out right away. So here's the final dig assembly being attached to the uh, output on the transmission. And in the manual it does show you um, 
where the levers are placed in order to see how the dig would be engaged or how the high speed would be engaged. Uh, it's all uh, very, uh, very easy to see. So interesting to note on this uh, slipper clutch assembly, there isn't a spring. Uh, and usually there is uh, to avoid um, being able to, uh, you know, break things. So that is pretty curious to me that that wasn't included. Uh, I'd love to see someone put one on there. Um, maybe uh, something I'll actually do in the future and show you a little how to later on. Um, but as you can see, nice, tight, compact unit. That's a 540 can uh, Castle 2850 censored brushless motor uh, and a nice metal motor mount, uh, which uh, keys in very nicely into this thing. Uh, much like other manufacturers, it does give you uh, a code for uh, your pinion. So uh, whatever tooth pinion you have, that's where you assemble the motor to the motor mount. I'm using the included 14 tooth pinion. Um, of course, if you're going to run a higher KV motor, you can probably step down. Uh, and then of course, if you're not using portals, you might even want to step it down further. Pretty nice, tight, compact setup. I really like how everything sits in there. You can see the motor is fairly high, but not that high overall. And uh, that's it. We're done for uh, this video. There will be a lot more to come coming up. Uh, in the next one, we start to tackle the links and move on to the other sections, including the chassis. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you guys again very soon.